Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lifehouse. So good to see uh, all you guys here in the room. Good to see you online as well. And hey, I was just talking to a guy uh, that just moved to Van Wert a couple weeks ago from New York. And he said, hey, my, my daughter still lives in New York and she watches every, every week online. So if you're online, welcome. We know there are a ton of you guys out there from all over the place. It's good to have you guys. And um, for all of us, is that we hope today's a, a great day. We have a, a really good service plan today. But before we get into it, I got to tell you, um, my family and I, we are huge Cleveland Guardians fans, formerly the Indians baseball team. Um, yeah, there's one other person. That's great. Um, and uh, so I've got, I've got four kids, and uh, they, we are part of this thing called the Guardians Kids Club. And uh, it's, it's a real thing, and you get like a free ticket and a bunch of Guardians gear and stuff. And part of, one of the perks is they, every home game, they choose a random kids club member to be the kids club member of the game. And then they put your picture on the scoreboard and their name and where you're from and favorite player and all that stuff. And so there are like thousands, literally thousands of kids that are part of the kids club. Um, and uh, my son, Jake, he's eight and he especially loves the Guardians and the kids club and this whole thing. So this is Friday night. I get a text from a couple cousins who happen to be at the game. There was a game Friday night. They text me. And apparently, it, like when they, when they put the Guardians Kids Club member of the game up on the scoreboard, um, they were looking at the scoreboard and they saw that that kid was from Van Wert. And they were like, oh, it's from Van Wert. And then they were like, oh, well, look, that kid's name's Jake. And then they were like, oh my gosh, that's Jake Holiday. And so I get, we got a picture of it. There, Jake was, yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> Guardians Kids Club member of the game. Jake said, we, we showed him, he was like, this is literally the best day of my life, Dad. It's the best day. He thinks he's famous and it's awesome and stuff. And the truth is, I don't tell him, like, he didn't really do anything special to get, you know, to get on there. It was just a random drawing. I don't want to tell him that. Um, but so he did nothing special. But if you're a parent, you know this. Like, he is special to me because he's my son, right? And so if you're new here, you may uh, come in, you feel like, hey, I, I'm, like, I'm not special. I didn't do anything special to be here. And we want you to know you are special to us. You, you matter to God as well. And uh, if you are new, we got a great thing that uh, we want to invite you to, to learn a little more about Lifehouse, because we know you might be trying to figure this thing out. And uh, it's something called Discover. And Discover is actually happening next Sunday at 11 o'clock during second service. And it's a one-hour session for you to just learn more about Lifehouse, who we are, um, what we're about, and where you might fit in. And we'll feed you lunch afterwards. You can have lunch with our lead pastor, Matt Brown. Um, but we want to invite you to that. And for all of us, whether you knew or not, we want to let you know that we have our next night of worship coming up in about a week and a half. So Tuesday, October 8th, night of worship right here at 7 o'clock, in person only. We've got some child care available. Um, but uh, night of worship is a chance for us to, to sing music. We've got communion, the Lord's Supper, and uh, we, we, it should be a great time. So we hope you all come to that. But for today, um, band's got a couple songs. Matt Brown, our lead pastor, is here. He's finishing up our message series called Make Room. We'll be here about an hour or so, and we get to experience something really cool here in just a second. Um, a friend of mine, Michael Grundon, is over here. Michael's going to get baptized today. Let's, let's give it up for Michael. <laughs> and uh, Nicole Oberlin is Michael's sister, and she is, serves on our guest services team, and they serve together, and Nicole's also Michael's sister, and so Nicole's going to be in the tank with him and getting to do the baptism, so that'll be a really cool thing. If you're new to church, baptism is just a way for somebody like Michael to go public with his faith in Jesus, so he's going to get dunked in some water. We're going to cheer when he comes up and celebrate, because that's one of the things we celebrate most around here, um, but all of us, we hope today is a chance for you to take a step in your faith toward a heavenly Father who loves you. We're going to start with a song. If you're in the room, I want to invite you to stand, and let's sing together this morning. Come on.
let not this world of sorrows steal my only hope away for the power of your gospel shines within this jar of clay in affliction you bring wisdom that my comforts can displace how my true and greatest treasure is in you the god of praise Like I said earlier, Michael is here because of the grace of God and the grace he's experienced his life. We get to hear a story and celebrate with him as he gets baptized. So go ahead and take your seat, and as you do, let's check out his story. Hi, my name is Michael Crundon. Um, this is my story. I never really grew up in a church home. I just believed God was always there. It's just like I could feel him. I just knew that he loved me. Had a lot of struggles along the way. Uh, I was addicted to drugs, and I'm sober now. It's been many years that I've been sober, so I thank God for that. And it, it took losing my dad seven years ago. That really uh, opened my eyes to get clean. 
Um, to be the man he always wanted me to be, no amount of pain could I ever went through could compare me to losing him. But through God, you know, he's got me through that. My wife, we've been together, you know, two years, and it's been more happy times than sad. And that's when I decided, you know, let's go to Lifehouse, because it's always been a home to me. Our, I know it's been hard for her, because our, her youngest, my stepson, um, her ex-husband caused him to have a brain injury. But the progress he's made is incredible. And we just see it every day. And that's when we decided to, you know, come here. And when she first came here, she told me how much she loved it. And then that's when we decided to join the you know, hospitality team. You know, help anybody in the need, get back to the community. Hopefully help someone find their way through Jesus Christ. Finding forgiveness through, you know, Jesus is, it's everything to me. It's opened so many life-changing experiences. It's given me my life back. I like to thank my wife, because when I met her, it's, everything changed. Um, the love we share is incredible. She's brought in my two beautiful stepsons. She took in my daughter as her own and showing her love. And that's, that's all I really wanted for us. I just want to thank God for everything he's done in my life and the great support system I have. You know, my family, my wife, my kids, my everyone. Um, it's been a long struggle, but life's it's not easy. But you know, through him, it's, it's getting better every day. Hi, I'm Michael, and I would like to declare today that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Michael, as your sister, I have seen you struggle with addiction and with the loss of your dad. And I am so proud to be standing next to you and witnessing the way God is using you in your life and how that is overflowing into your children and your wife and our family. So because of that declaration of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So good, and thank you guys for singing with us and celebrating Michael's story. You guys can take your seat. It's so good. Let's give that up. Give it up for Michael one more time. Yeah, dude. Here, you need to know this. Um, I've known Nicole for a few years. She's been around, really a, a faithful part of what we're doing around here at Lifehouse, and. Um, you guys saw her heart, but I just want you to know that she has been praying for Michael and, and loving on him and wanting him to um, get reconnected with his heavenly father for years that has been on her heart. And so to see this kind of come full circle is just like, you can't make that up, you know, can't make it up. Um, it's so good. And you see stuff like that around here all the time. You know, it's, it's such a cool story. But people's lives being changed 
relationships being mended, people taking steps toward their Heavenly Father. And it is, it's so cool to be a part of that. Um, God's given us grace. He's shown us grace. And, and so many of you around here do such a great job of showing that grace to others. And um, I want to let you all know that next Sunday, October 6th, is uh, one of our favorite Sundays of the year. It's a chance for us to, to, to show our generosity to our community, people in need. It's called Be Rich. We've been doing this for a number of years now. And um, we, uh, as part of Be Rich, this celebration of generosity, we've uh, started something called For the Students. And through Be Rich, we have put shoes and coats in the closets of, of kids who need that sort of thing. We've got a lot of people in our community in need, and we just want to do our part to help them out. And so we're rolling this out next Sunday. So uh, if you call Lifehouse Home, you want to be here. It's one of those don't miss Sundays. If you don't call Lifehouse Home and you're here, you want to be here for that. And not only that, but it is a great Sunday to invite someone. We say that a lot, and you guys do so well with inviting people. Um, but this is a really great Sunday to invite a friend or family member, a coworker that you, you feel like needs church, needs Jesus, just needs something. Next Sunday is a great chance to do that because you'll get to see us as a church, as a, as a, as a body of Lifehouse, be at our best, to be generous to our community in need. It's one of our favorite times of year, and I hope it is for you guys too. So we'd love to see you and a friend, family member next week for Be Rich. We're gonna keep rolling with today's service. I'm gonna turn things over to, to our lead pastor, Matt Brown, for today's message. Have you ever noticed that hard things are hard to start? Um, anything that's hard to do is just hard to get going with. Years ago, I was what you'd call a student pastor. I worked with teenagers, and all the other student pastors I knew played the guitar, and so I decided I need to learn how to play the guitar. Now, heads up, I have no rhythm, and I can't sing on tune. In fact, when we're singing songs around here, if you're standing next to me, I mean, I'm just like a dumb gorilla over there, offbeat all the time. But I decided I need to learn how to play the guitar, and when I started playing, no one told me how much it hurts your fingers. I mean, because your fingers are kind of sensitive, and you're putting on steel strings, and it would just kill my fingers, and I tried every trick in the book, dipping them in wax. One, somebody told me I put Band-Aids on them, and nothing worked except time and practice and time and practice, and over enough time, my fingers got callous, and I could just play it without pain, but it just reinforces the idea that hard things can be really hard to start. We'll come back to that in a second, because we're wrapping up a two-week series called Make Room, the spiritual life for ordinary people. People. This is this idea that we want to make room for God, or at least a lot of us do, um, for God and his power and his grace and who he is in us. But what's challenging for us is sometimes being close to God and you know, being connected to God, it can, well, let's just be honest, it can feel elusive. It can feel a little abstract, like what does it look like and what does it feel like? And for some of us, it can even be frustrating along the way. And we titled this Ordinary People because we realize we're all just ordinary people. In fact, if you're new here or you're watching online thinking, hey, do I want to be a part of this church? You're around some ordinary people. And if you've ever been around church people that declare them extraordinary, you should just run away from them because they're not extraordinary. We're all ordinary people. I grew up in a church world, you know, that some people want to tell everybody that they were prophets or apostles or they had the superpower that God had given them and they were better than everybody else. And the truth is, once you got to know them, you're like, hey, you're just ordinary like the rest of us. But what does it look like 
to invite God into the ordinary things of our lives, like our marriages and our work days and raising our kids and working out and ask God to join us in that. Because this is what we discovered last week, that God will fill whatever space we make for him in our lives. And again, there are no super Christians in our church. We're just people that are trying to figure out how to connect to God. And so what we've been talking about is spiritual disciplines. And this can be an intimidating word, spiritual disciplines, but if you just break it down to a discipline itself, we've all practiced the discipline in our lives, whether it's you know running or working out or trying to figure something out where we exercise that ability. And we defined um, a spirit or a discipline last week as any activity. Now this is not a spiritual thing, just discipline in general. I can do that will enable me to do eventually do what I cannot currently do. Um, some of you decided when you turn 40, I want to run a marathon and you never run a mile in your life. I know some of you are like, I will never decide to run a marathon, but some of you did. Um, and, and you, but you never run a mile in your life. And you started with a mile and you worked it to three miles and 10 miles. And one day you find yourself running across the finish line of a marathon. I mean, if you're an adult and you've always thrown a baseball with your right hand and you decide at 40 years old, you want to take a shot at the major leagues, well, it's not going to work out, but you're a dreamer. And so you think, if I could just throw a left-handed curveball and you retrain yourself to throw with your left hand, you know this, for a long time, it's going to feel really weird, really awkward because you've got to retrain everything. But after time and practice, you dis discipline yourself to make that happen. Okay, I gotta touch on a sensitive subject in our church, all right? Just give me a second. Some of you are close talkers. Do you know what a close talker is? In the lobby, you stand six inches away from my face and you're a close talker. And you need to work on the discipline of backing up two feet and give me some room because your breath smells bad. Just a few of you, and I love you, but you're a close talker. And you don't know you're a close talker, so now I'm informing you. Somebody said to me um, after first service, Matt, thank you for addressing the bane of my existence, and that's close talker. You gotta take an inch step back every day and not be a close talker. That's, those are disciplines. A spiritual discipline Spiritual disciplines make room for us to experience more of God's transforming power in our lives. We do this so we can be closer to Jesus and love other people. The goal of spiritual discipline is to be closer to Jesus, to look up and say, Jesus, you're here and I want to know you and I want you to know me and then I want to love other people. We talked about this last week to have more of what's called the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, more love, more peace, more patience. And how many of our lives in this crazy, chaotic culture we're in right now could use a little bit more peace? And the reason we have to put in the effort and work to discipline ourselves is it's not natural to have things like peace. And here's the deal as we talk about these today. I'm going to remind you, the goal of spiritual disciplines is not to be a super Christian. It's not to say I'm more righteous than everybody else. And it's not even to know more things. It's to be transformed by knowing Jesus. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote over half or a third of the New Testament, he talked about this to his mentor, e, um, Timothy. Timothy was a pastor of a church, and he writes to Timothy, and he said, Timothy, I want you to train yourself to be godly. Now, depending on what background you were raised in, when you heard the phrase, be godly, I mean, you may have thought, all right, am I supposed to drink or cuss or chew or, you know, all those things, and maybe that's true, but that may not necessarily be exactly what Paul was getting after. I think he was saying, Timothy, I want you to train yourself and other people to be like Jesus, to love and practice the way of Jesus. And he, here's the thing, as we talk about training, your mind and my mind can immediately go to, hey, I gotta put in the work, and here's the deal, you do have to put in the work, it takes work to do this, but you're not working for, you're working from someplace. You're not working for God's grace. You're not working for God's love. You're not doing this so God will go, okay, now I'm happy with you. You're working from a place that God does love me, he thinks the world of me and he wants to be close to me. I'm working from that place and I'm working so I make room for him in my life. Paul says to Timothy, 
for physical training is of some value. You know, learning how to run a marathon or weight training or to throw a ball or whatever your physical training is. But godliness, being like Jesus, has value for all things, holding promise for both present life and the life to come. Uh, Timothy, you just need to understand that if you would train yourself in these spiritual things, it's going to pay off for eternity, but not just eternity. This is not just about what happens after you die. This is in this present life. You add value to your life by following and chasing after godliness in the now. The question for us today is if it matters in the now, then how? How do we do this? Dallas Willard, who's long gone to be with Jesus, wrote some amazing stuff on spiritual disciplines. He would call it spiritual formations. If you're ever looking for some great reading material around growing close to God, Dallas Willard is a go-to author. Well, Dallas wrote about two ways that we engage in spiritual disciplines, and the first he writes about is the discipline of engagement. Um, this is the idea of an intentionally doing something with God. Um, this is the idea of if I'm not good at something, then I need to engage in the practice of what I'm not good at. For instance, if I'm not good at communicating with my spouse, I need to communicate with my spouse. If I'm not good at being generous, then I need to make a decision to be generous. This is engaging in an activity that helps me grow in an area that I want to grow. The other area Dallas talked about was the discipline of abstinence, which is a little weird because when we think of abstinence, we just think about sexuality sometimes. The idea of abstinence is the idea of not doing some stuff that we struggle with. I'm saying no to ourselves in some areas that so we could grow in those areas. Like if you really have a sin in your life that just kind of haunts you, that you would say no to that and the areas around that that would help you say no to whatever that, you know, whatever dark, evil, tough thing is in your life. You, you may say, I'm not going to indulge in that. I'm not going to chase after that. I'm going to say no to that. Now here's the disclaimer about these two areas that I'm going to talk through this morning. The disclaimer is they are not comprehensive. Like there may be other disciplines that you practice that help you grow closer to God. I totally respect that, so you just need to know that. The other disclaimer is a few of these I'm not actually practicing right now in my own life, so I'm trying to figure out how to implement them in my life, and so I'm not either good at all these or do all of these in my life. Lastly, this is really important, they're difficult to do sometimes. They're hard, they're frustrating at times. So I wanna talk about these things. Now, when it comes to spiritual disciplines, all of our spiritual disciplines, I think, should be actionable, like I can do action with them. They should be applicable to my life so it changes my life and they should be accessible, something that's actually able, something I can actually do in my life. Sorry about that. But all of them are not all skate. And as I talk through these, I would love for everyone that's listening, online and in the room, even if you're not sure you believe in Jesus or you've been a Christian for a long time, I would like everybody to consider doing one. Because if we would just do one, it would move us down the path of being closer to Jesus, I'm convinced. So let, let's start with the disciplines of engagement. Um, one last, just like, warning to you. Last week, um, the message I gave was all about inspiration. I was trying to motivate you to get ready for this, to think in light of who Jesus is in your life. Today will not feel as inspiring, but a little bit more taxing. I just want you to know that. So if halfway through the message as I'm talking, you go, wow, this just feels hard. It feels hard because it is. And some things in life that are worth doing can just be hard. They take work. And here's the other part. As I put all these on the screen, there may be a lot to remember. You are welcome to pull out your phone and take a picture of what I put up on my screen so you can remember when you get home. The disciplines of engagement are simply studying the scriptures that we're talking about today, prayer, and giving. And I want to give you a few thoughts on each. We could spend two months on all these things. But let's Let's start with studying the scripture. We'll, we'll put this up. Studying the scripture is um, the idea of taking the scriptures, the Bible, and reading it. But here, listen to me when I say this. It's not for information's sake. It's for transformation's sake. And you know this because what you put in your mind changes everything else about you. What you put in your mind, the perspective you have on the world, and as you see truth, guides the rest of your life. But the goal of reading the scripture is not to be smart. I have a grandfather who's gone to be with Jesus, 
who read his Bible every day, but he probably, and literally, I love him so much, he probably understood about 5% of what he read, but man, did he apply the love of Jesus in his life. He was a spiritual hero of mine because he decided it's not about knowing everything, it's about taking what I can and doing something with it. And the last thing we need is more people that know the Bible, but don't live it out. That know what Jesus said, but don't love like Jesus. In fact, if you're here and you're not a Christian and you like have a bent against us Christians, the best way to see what we're supposed to be about is to read the scripture. And Jesus himself, when he was tempted by the evil one, we talked about this in our icon series, when he was tempted by the evil one to you know, bow before Satan, he, he used the scriptures to say, no, that's not what is best in God's kingdom. So when we think about studying the scripture, studying the scripture is more about quality than quantity, because this is difficult. And the goal is not to get through all the scriptures. The goal is to get the scriptures through us completely. If you're a person that like just has to read the Bible in a year, I respect that. And you go do that, that's great. But just so you know, you probably will not retain most of what you read if you hammer through the whole Bible in a year. Now again, if you want to do that, that's great. But just know there's a lot of information to understand. So when you read the scripture, find a way that it connects with you. We use this app around here a lot. It's called the Bible app. It used to be called the version. Now it's called the Bible app. It is maybe the easiest, most effective way to read the Bible wherever you go. So if you don't have the Bible app, you should download it. And what's cool about this is the Bible app, you can push a button and it actually reads the Bible to you. And um, one time I changed the voice and it was a female voice, which actually was a little sexy and she read the words of Jesus. And I went, oh no, 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 no. No, no, back to the dude's voice for me at least. That does not, I cannot hear Jesus that way. That doesn't help me at all. But here's the deal. If it helps for you to hear the scripture while you read it, read and hear it. That's fine. If it helps you to use a translation that's just a little more simple, use whatever it helps you to hear and understand. But when you hear it, apply it. Apply what it says to your finances. Apply what it says about your relationships. Apply what it says to how you see Jesus. The goal is not just to know. It's to know in your heart and let it change us. And set yourself up success. And my suggestion, if you're going to do that, you should, it would be helpful to pick a time, a place, and a plan. If you want to start something and have longevity, you got to pick a time. If you just say, well, I'll get to it tomorrow sometime. You know this, if it's not on the calendar, if you're not intentional, you probably won't get to it. Then you got to pick a place. You got to pick a place that you're comfortable and you can focus in. And if you're a you know, parent of little kids, this is going to be challenging for you. But you pick a place for other things you want to get done. So I just encourage you, pick a place that you can get quiet and comfortable. And maybe it's when the kids take a nap or get off to school or whatever your deal is. If you're a business person, you you get to work 15 minutes early so you can have a quiet moment at your desk. And then pick a plan. Again, if you use the Bible app, there's like a thousand different plans that will take you through the book of John or it'll talk you through prayer or help you see you know, grieving or love and it'll talk about that through a plan and it'll guide you through it. It's a little bit dangerous and I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just a little bit dangerous to flip through like a Rolodex, your Bible and put your finger on a verse and read it out of context because it can just confuse you. But a plan will help guide you through it. And if you're just a book person, you know, go to Amazon. There's all kinds of devotionals and ways to walk through the Bible, but you got to take some initiative. And I, and I actually thought, I didn't say this in first service, I thought about giving everybody a plan, but the truth is you can't count on me to find your plan for you. You've got to find a plan and there's so many resources out there to do it. So find a time, find a place, and find a plan. Let's talk about prayer real quick. And again, I told you, this is not comprehensive. This is fly by at 10,000 feet just to hopefully whet your appetite. Prayer, this is probably where people feel the most guilt because people would say this to me, I haven't prayed in a while. Oh, I'm not doing very good. I haven't talked to God. And and part of it's because we don't know how to pray. And I would just encourage you that prayer is just simply to listen to God, to talk to God, to be honest to God and align our souls with God. And if you grew up in church, maybe you know how to pray, but maybe you're more confused than ever about prayer. And if you're new, this is certainly difficult. So I would suggest you start with what we would call simple prayers. As simple as you can. And by simple, I mean you just bring you to God. 
as you are. And I want to give you permission. I've been doing this a long time. You do not need to impress God with who you are. It's not like you're meeting your girlfriend's parents for the first time. You remember that awkward thing where you just wanted to show your best? God knows your worst. C.S. Lewis, this amazing writer from years ago, said, do not come to God as you ought to be. Think about the power of this. Do not come to God as you ought to be. Come to God as you are, because he already knows who you are. And practice just being with God where you are and who you are. And he'll change you, but he can't change you if we put on pretenses. So here's three things that I would suggest that you get a pen and paper and write down before you pray, maybe every time you pray. And you can do this in just two or three minutes. Write these things down. Write down how am I feeling. Write down, is there anything I'm afraid or anxious about? And what are three things I'm grateful for? How, how am I feeling? Well, the truth is, I woke up today and I'm feeling pretty dang good. I feel like my life's going in a good direction. Um, truth is, I woke up today and I am fearful and I'm sad and I'm grieving. And God, I want you to know this. So I'm writing this down and I want to talk about how I'm feeling. Is there anything I'm afraid of or anxious about? Write, write it down. See, this is what we often do when we pray. We, we, we're like, God, fix this. Fix this. And if you have kids that are not doing what, exactly what you want them to do, the temptation is just fix my kids, just fix my kids. And you know this, that doesn't always happen immediately. And sometimes it feels like it never happens. Sometimes pastors like me will say, listen, if you're worried about our country, and we'll quote some verse that's a promise for ancient Israel in the Old Testament, if you would just pray, God would make our land perfect. And, and you know right now that probably... That probably is not going to happen. But God, I'm worried about my kids, and I'm going to write it down. I'm worried about our country, and I need you to know what I'm worried about, God, because I'm having trouble getting through this day and my anxiousness. I'm writing it down. And then I just want you to know, God, these are the things I'm thankful for. And you write those down. And then here's what you do. You take your list that you just wrote down, and you tell God about them all. God, I'm hurting I'm really afraid and I'm anxious. And we live in a culture where people are more anxious now than I'm convinced they ever have been. And there's all kinds of research to back that up. And listen, I'm all for you may need to take something for that and get counseling for that. That's great. You should do that. But I just wonder if we could drop the temperature of anxiousness and worry and fear. If we would stop telling God to fix everything and just tell him about what we're wanting to be fixed. I'm just really scared, God. I need you to know. And then, God, I just want to tell you all the things I'm grateful for. You want to change your perspective on the day? You just start listing all the things you're thankful to God for. It will shock you how well your life is going in the midst of some hard things. This is, this is simply prayer. This is an easy way to say simple prayers to God. And at the end, you might realize, I feel closer to God right now than I have in a long, long time. It's prayer. Then there's this really challenging thing, it's giving. And some of you are like, oh, we're talking about giving. Here's what you need to know. Jesus talked more about giving in your money and my money than he talked about anything else. Because he knew what threatens your heart more than anything else is your stuff and what you have and your future stuff. And we are all bent towards loving money and loving stuff. We don't admit that, but it is just True, and we would say this, and we say this all the time, money's not bad, money's not evil, having money's not bad, until it's your master. Because if you're a Christian, you already have a master. And his name is Jesus. And there's a constant tug of war between who is our master, our stuff, or Jesus. And Jesus simply said, you will know where your heart is when you see where your treasure is and where your treasure goes. And God doesn't really want your money, but he certainly wants your heart. And often when we talk about this um, giving, and I'm not afraid to say this at all, we give for the mission of our church. We give towards keeping the lights on and hiring great staff and doing things in our community. But when I'm talking about this right now in this moment, this is a spiritual discipline because it changes my heart of what owns my life. And if you would be willing to do this, well, it might change a lot inside you. And if you don't know where to start, I would just suggest you start with percentage giving. Now, you may think, yeah, okay, I got to give 10%. That's what I taught was the tithe. No, I, I, I would just encourage you, if you've never been a generous giver, um, start at any percent. Start at 2% or 5%. You know, start wherever you want. Just pick a percentage and go, I'm going to give this away before I spend it on me. When it comes in, this percentage is always going to go out. And I love it when people decide to do that with their local church because it's amazing things 
are happening. And what it reminds you is everything we have in this earth fades away and it rusts and it's gone at the end of our lives. And it's something that changes our hearts. So pick a percentage and just be consistent about giving it away. It's a discipline that every time you do that, you go, God, it's not all mine. It's yours and you just let me use it and borrow it and have it for a time, but I just want to recognize that I'm trusting you in this. Percentage giving is a great way to do that. Another way you can think about this is giving to charity. Charity is what marked the early church because they lived this out because for them to survive, they had to be charitable to them and the people around them. The way of following Jesus in the first century required incredible charity. Just a reminder, and Brian mentioned this, next week we are launching our Be Rich initiative for the students. You have got to be here. And you've got to bring something that needs to see a better version of the church because when Christians are charitable, and we open up you know, our greedy hands. And I got some greedy hands. I'm right there with you. Man, the world watches. And they go, you know what? Maybe they really believe in what they are saying. One of the things that is often said by people like me, pastors, is, hey, we got to protect the tax initiatives when it comes to churches and nonprofits. We got to make sure it's a tax deduction when you give to a church. And I love the fact we have that opportunity in our country. But guys like me get so worried about that. If we lose our tax exempt status, everything is going to fall apart. And you know this. We don't do this for a tax exempt status. We don't do it so we can write it off for the IRS. That's fine if you do that. That's great. We do this because we want our heart to be God's. We want to be charitable people. We want to know that it is not all for us. Disciplines of engagement. They're, they're pretty simple. They're studying the scriptures. They're spending time talking to God through prayer. And it's giving, being generous, a percentage giver and being charitable. So that's engagement. That's something you do. Let's talk about the harder one, the weirder one. And that's the discipline of abstinence. Remember, this is exercising a muscle that you need to refrain from, something you need to step away from. And, and the three disciplines of abstinence are silence and solitude, the Sabbath, and fasting, when I read this, some of you are like, ugh, I would have rather just written a check. That's so much easier to give than some of these things you're asking me to do. I get it. So let's talk about silence and solitude, this powerful, powerful, ancient practice. You know this, and I know this. Life's super noisy. No, noisy. Can't get my words out today. And then it's noisy because we all have phones that remind us of the next thing we're supposed to do and all the news in our lives, but it's not just our phones. You also, some of you have like 187 kids you've raised in your house right now. And it's chaos. It's like a bunch of monkeys running around destroying everything, right? And they have needs and they're noisy. And you got a husband who's always after something. And we won't talk about that right now. And he's always after something. Not to mention there's this low hum. And it's not so noisy, but it's just a hum of anxiety in our lives. Like it's a low white noise hum of I'm nervous about what's next and what's going next. And this is the place that silence and solitude it steps in. And we get to follow in the way of Jesus in this. Because Jesus modeled this. It's this idea of muting the external noise of our lives. Even if it's just for a few minutes. But maybe more importantly, it's muting the noise in our heads. It's turning off our mind. that Everything that's flowing around in there. It, it's finding a quiet place. Whew, that's a hard thing to do these days, isn't it? A quiet place to allow your soul to be still with God. And obviously, you've got to shut down the noise with your kids. You've got to shut down the noise of your phone. But also, all this that's going on up here, the comparing with your sister and your coworkers and your friends and how they're doing. It's the conversations you wish you had and wish you hadn't had that flow in your mind. It's where you stay quiet. Now, I know this. If you're a young parent with a bunch of kids, you're looking at me right now and saying, Matt, you're an empty nester, you idiot. This is so easy for you. I get this. And in some ways it is. But you also know this, whether you're a young parent, you're an older parent, or you're just in a different place in life, we all can make room for what we want to make room for. Here's what's interesting. Silence is disturbing for all of us. When I uh, did a retreat with some guys not too long ago, I gave them the assignment of taking an hour of silence and solitude. And it was so funny, almost every one of us said the first 10 minutes we made it, 
And then we just crashed and burned. We started thinking about things, planning things. Some people said, it looks like I had to read my Bible just to do something. And I think it's so important to read your Bible. That's not necessarily silence and solitude. The idea is we have to have something to occupy our mind, to, to engage our mind as opposed to just being still, which is a, something that's said right out of the scriptures. This might be helpful if you don't know how to have science and solitude. It's a breathing exercise. And when I was growing up on church, in church as a kid, if you talked about a breathing exercise, it would get tagged as new age or some kind of weird spiritual thing. This is just breathing because God told us he's the breath of life. And when he breathed in us, he breathed life into us. Your most basic need in your life is not food or shelter. It is oxygen. And to breathe reminds us who we are. So I thought I'd give you just a simple breathing exercise. You breathe in and you do this four full cycles. One cycle, you breathe in for four seconds. One, two, three, five. I can't do it and talk at the same time. I apologize, I'm not that gifted. And then you hold your breath in just for four seconds. And then you exhale for four seconds. And when you get all the air out or most of the air out, you just hold that for four seconds and you do that four times around and you may be like, Matt, what's the value in this? One of the values, it's sobering to remind us that you are one breath away from not being alive on this planet anymore. When you realize that your breath is given from God, you look up and go, God, thank you for my breath. I know I'm worried about my 401k and my kids. and Thank you for breath, God. Calm me down. I do a very similar thing before I get on stage or speak to anybody in any crowd. There's a, there's a rhythm of breathing and, and prayer I pray. And it's part of it's spiritual and part of it's just to calm myself down. I'd suggest you try doing that. And you might find you're inviting God into your life in a way that you haven't in a while. Do four minutes of this. You don't have to do an hour of it. Do, do three minutes of it. And I'm convinced when Jesus got alone, this is what he would do with his heavenly father. Uh, another interesting practice that we're not familiar with, with in the West is the Sabbath. This was something that the Hebrew world practiced diligently. And the Sabbath in the original language simply means just to stop. John Mark Comer, another excellent writer, he, in his research, he also found out that it means to delight. And Sabbath simply means to take 24 hours to stop and delight take 24 hours to say to work and running in a frenetic pace, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to spend time with God and enjoy my life for today. So here's what I would encourage you to do. If you want to try this, pick a Sabbath. For me, my Sabbath is Friday because I'm off on Friday. For you, it might be Saturday. Maybe it's Sunday because you incorporate church in it. But pick a day that you call your 24-hour Sabbath. I'll, I'll describe my Sabbath um, and if you're a parent and you got little kids, hang on. I got a, a way to navigate, a, for a way for you to navigate through a Sabbath. For me, this is my Sabbath. It's on Friday. I'm not taking your phone calls, just so you all know. You better be on desk door for to get my attention. I am checking out. I'm not working. I'm not planning. I'm trying to avoid my phone at all costs. I wake up as late as I possibly can on my Sabbath. That's my rhythm. First thing I do is drink coffee, because that's what good godly men do. I drink lots of coffee, and I like to have some Aussie bites with my coffee. Then I spend some time reading the scripture and trying to have some quiet and solitude. If I cannot fit those things in in my life in the normal part of the week, I make sure I have solitude and quiet on my Sabbath. And after I'm done with that, you know what I do? The most spiritual thing in the world I could do, I go play golf. Heck yeah, I play golf, baby. <laughs> And you're like, that's not spiritual. It is when you invite Jesus to come along with you. Man, when Jesus is with me, I hit it longer and straighter than you would imagine. That's a joke, but I like to think that's true. But think about the joy of doing what you enjoy doing and inviting God to join you in it. Then I come home, I have a big lunch, I have a nap, sometimes I get my hair cut, I spend the dinner with my wife or my kids, I listen to the Van Wert Cougars football game, and then I go to bed whenever I want, and I think about God through the whole day. And at the end of the day, I feel so much better. Well, Matt, you're an empty nester, you idiot. You can't do that when you have kids. Here's what we would do or we try to do when we had kids. Incorporate them into your Sabbath. We wake up on a Saturday. We have a big breakfast. 
We let them put peanut butter and syrup on their pancakes and we enjoy it and they throw um, um, popcorn and ice cream on it. Enjoy the Sabbath. Don't tell their mom. Just do it, dads. It will win you favor with your kids. Read a little scripture and pray with your kids. Have a movie time every Saturday. That's your thing. If you like to play outside, take your kids and play outside. Uh, have a required rest time. You ought to go do your thing because dad or mom's taking a nap and we're going to do something fun at night. Teach your kids to enjoy the Sabbath. And ask God to be in the middle of it with your kids all day long. It's a beautiful thing. It's just a choice. It's just a, it's just a choice. And here's what's going to be a challenge for some of you because you're super driven. Maybe, and I'm not being offensive. I just know this is a real thing. You have adult ADHD and you can't sit down for a second. It's going to help you. I got I to do something. No, you don't. God told you to rest. And I know I'm going to get an email or two or somebody, well, I just, yeah, you tell Jesus that. Don't tell me that. You argue with Jesus about this. This is his plan because the Sabbath, it lets us stop producing for just a day. I don't know if I said this already. Don't take six days of Sabbath. Did I say that already? You take one day of Sabbath and work hard six days a week. Some of you are like, oh, I got to play video games for six days. No, no. You take one day of Sabbath and work hard for six days and stop producing on that Sabbath. And then you delight in life. And I guarantee you, as you practice this, guilt will set in. And you'll be like, I got to do something. And Jesus is going to remind you, no, you don't. This is for your soul. This is for your family. This is for your relationship with God. I got asked not too long ago, how have you done this job for 31, 32 years. And part of it is finding ways to do this. Last thing I'll say about this, then I gotta move on. Parents, this is gonna offend some of you. I love you, so I'm not afraid to offend you. You would say to me right now, if we could be ha have coffee, I can't do a Sabbath because I've involved my kids, and then you would list off every youth sport, every dance thing, every other thing your kids are doing, which those are all fine. I'm not against any of those. I can't do this because of all these things. And I would just remind you, parents, you have chosen those things. They did not choose you. You committed to those things. They did not commit to you. And whatever you choose is where you end up. And you, lovingly, can choose differently. And these are the things that matter, I think, the most. Let's talk about the last one, fasting. This is a tough one. Um, fasting, when we think about fasting, some people talk about fasting from their cell phone or from TV or from whatever. This specifically, we're talking about food. And I need you to know I have fasted in the past. I have not fasted, full disclosure, in a while. So I'm not practicing this. And I didn't want to be a cheesehead and, and you know, fast this week for one hour, one day, and say I've done it. So I'm, I haven't practiced in a while. But I'm telling you, this is something. It's a powerful tool. What's interesting is right now, research is showing that there's a benefit health-wise to fasting. And like, huh, that's so interesting. But we don't do this for health reasons or weight loss, although do what you need to do for that. This is about denying ourselves of something. This is about this idea of appetites. And you know what an appetite is. It's food. You have an appetite for food. You also have an appetite for approval. You have an appetite for sex and for glory and control and pleasure. And the list just goes on and on and on. And when we fast specifically from food and say no to food in a way that, you know, is a little bit painful, it helps us to take control or an old religious word, dominion over our appetites. And you know this, some of our appetites wreck us. Some of us have families that have been wrecked by our appetites. And this allows us to say no to our appetites. It allows us to say no to you and no to me and yes to God's spirit. No to certain things so I can say yes to more peace and more joy and more patience and kindness and goodness. God's best for us and you want that. Because the moment you're controlled by any appetite, you're not controlled by God. The other part of Appetites is so interesting because it reveals something in us. When you deny yourself, things surface that can be a little bit icky. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, he talks about anger, bitterness, jealousy, and strife, fear, if they are within us. Pause for a minute. Have any of you experienced anger, bitterness, jealousy, strife? Anybody got some fear bubbling up in them in this world? You, sleep, you sleeping well right now? Yeah, I mean, right they are within us. 
they surface during fasting. He goes on. He says, at first, we rationalize that our anger is due to hunger. I'm hangry. Then we realize that we are angry because the spirit of anger is already in there. He says, we can, we can rejoice in this knowledge because we know that healing is available through the power of Christ. He's making an association that when you give yourself a break from food and you feel whatever rise up in you, it's not because the food is because it's already there and it brings it to the surface and we can bring it to Jesus. And that's the whole idea of fasting. I deny something. It stirs something in me, and every time I'm stirred, whether I'm hungry, I'm feeling a little angry or fearful, I look up and say, Jesus, I need you in with me right now. Work in me. An easy way to start fasting, if you just want to try it one time, is do a 20-hour fast. Fast after lunch to lunch the next day. So you're just missing dinner and a breakfast. And every time you feel hungry, whatever it stirs up, just look up and say, God, I need you. And it might awaken something in you that, poof, you didn't know was there in the best way. Drink some water and drink some juice, that's probably good. Fa fasting's powerful because hunger reminds us of our need for God and self-control and love in our life. So, so here's the deal. Discipline of abstinence is silence and solitude. Breathe, learn how to breathe and just be still and hear God's quiet voice, whatever that sounds like. I'm not going to even tell you what it sounds like. Just listen. Sabbath, a day of rest and fasting. If you look at all of these disciplines, the disciplines of engagement are studying the scripture, prayer, giving, and again, silence and solitude, Sabbath and fasting. If you're taking pictures, you might want to take a picture of all these together. Here's what I'd love for you to do. Pick one. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Jesus follower, but you're trying to figure out some spiritual practices, just pick one and do it. If you're a Jesus follower, maybe you pick a couple. Maybe you make sure you're praying and studying the scriptures. And then pick another one to add to it. And if you miss one, if you, if you don't get one right one day, do not be ridden by guilt and shame. Do not beat yourself up, because God's not. Just get back on it the next day. Return to it. And let it change you from the inside out because consistent habits of drawing close to God open and make room for him to be right there with us. And we won't miss anything when we do these things. Spiritual disciplines, we said, they make room for us to experience mo more of God's transforming power in our lives. To love him and love God. But the truth is, to do this, as Paul told Timothy, we gotta train ourselves day in and day out in a way that joyfully brings life to us by being close to Jesus. I could not let the series finish without reminding all of us, including myself, something that Jesus said at the end of his life to his best friends, to you and to me. Guys, surely I am with you always to the very ends of this age. We're not doing any of this to get God to come our way. He already has. I am with you always when we make room for him it allows him to invade our lives invade our hearts invade our families invade our communities it changes us that's why spiritual disciplines are powerful they add value it's God's kingdom come down to earth in us I am with you always you, you may not think this way you may have never heard this before I am convinced that Jesus' greatest desire is to be with you and I. And I can't explain why. It doesn't make sense to me. And he's not here to beat us up. He's here to love us and transform us into what we can be, what we are created to be. So pick a discipline. Pick two or three and implement them. And be changed. It may not happen in a week. It may not happen in a month. But you might look back in a year or 10 years and go, boy, that was the best decision to practice that discipline I ever made. Heavenly Father, I can talk about this stuff all day long. For me, it's hard to do. But let me be motivated to work from your love. And because you love me, because you call me your child, and not for those things. Help us all to figure out how to make room for you in our lives. And for the man or woman that's online or in the room that's like, I don't even know if I believe this. I pray they would make room so maybe they could see you clearly and believe in the future. For those of us that follow you, God, we're not following you because this is a religious activity. 
We're not following you because it's what you're supposed to do. We're following you because you're the best thing there is. And let us experience the best thing there is, and that's you, Jesus. Help us to find that quiet, that truth in your scripture, the conversation with you, a day of just enjoying life that you gave us, saying no to ourselves. Help us to just lean into that and find more life in you. And thanks for your love and patience for us along the way. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last song together. Thank you for singing with us this morning. Have a wonderful day and a great week. God bless.